Oh, hello. <laughs> Welcome back to more of the mystery book. We are now on chapter six. We finished chapter five. And chapter six is titled, You Probably Won't Face a Firing Squad in the Great Reset, but you may be put in a digital gulag. We've spent a lot of time reviewing the writings of Klaus Schwab and other globalists, but what is the evidence these plans are being put into motion? I think it's important to realize we're unlikely to find an email from Klaus Schwab directing some world leader, like say Justin Trudeau of Canada, on how to deal with the situation. However, when we understand the philosophy of the globalists, the question is, can we find examples that appear consistent enough with their views that we can assume their involvement at some level? I believe we can find multiple examples of such efforts, beginning first with the trucker convoy that surrounded the Canadian Parliament in January and February of 2022 in protest of the COVID restrictions. This is how the protests were described in Fortune magazine. The brigade, brigade, the brigade of truck driving protesters from Canada first converged in Ottawa on January 28th, occupying various streets around the nation's capital. The protest began in opposition to the introduction of a mandate requiring all cross-border truck drivers to be vaccinated against COVID-19. According to the Canadian Trucking Alliance, roughly 90% of Canadian truck drivers were already vaccinated, but a minority of truckers objected to the new requirement for drivers hauling goods between Canada and the U.S. As the protests and their convoy spread across Canada, the focus of the demonstration expanded to oppose all pandemic-era mandates, such as mask requirements and COVID vaccine passport check-ins. Do you like my little, uh, my little uh, newscaster voice there? Okay, never mind. You might have followed the trucker protests in Canada, but maybe you didn't. I thought the Fortune article did a pretty good job of summarizing how the protests started. Most protest movements start with a single issue, such as in the United States, with the death of George Floyd in police custody, and then develop into a discussion of some larger issues, such as police practices across the country and their effect on communities of color. Democracies are born in protest, and it is what gives them vitality. As we, as we have abundantly shown in this book, the globalists are not fond of protests, as they believe there is no reason to talk with their opponents. Did Trudeau deal with the protesters in a way consistent with a globalist approach? You decide. For protesters, the first bad omen for their movement hit on February 5th, when GoFundMe suspended Lich's fundraising account after receiving police reports of protest violence and other unlawful activity. This fundraiser is now in violation of our terms of service, Term 8, which prohibits the promotion of violence or harassment and has been removed from the platform, GoFundMe said, adding that it would return the $8 million raised back to donors. Undeterred by the loss of millions, protest organizers simply switched fundraising tactics. Shortly after GoFundMe shut down the group's main account, four protest supporters calling themselves Hong Kong Coddle, launched a new fundraising page on crypto fundraising site TallyCoin. I think that's what they were called, Hong Kong Coddle. Last word is H-O-D-L. The article continues by informing the readers that the crypto site was then shut down by Canada's federal police and transactions of 34 crypto wallets were to be halted. Eventually, another 146 crypto wallets were also frozen. The government of Canada had, without due process, restricted the financial transactions of law-abiding Canadians. A dangerous precedent 
had just been set by the Trudeau government, but they weren't finished. Last Monday, Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau delivered the Freedom Convoy campaign its final death blow and invoked the Emergencies Act for the first time in Canadian history, empowering police to move against the protesters. We cannot and will not allow illegal and dangerous activities to continue, Trudeau said, as he invoked the Emergencies Act, which granted police greater leeway to impose fines, imprison protesters, and tow vehicles blocking roads. The Emergencies Act also compelled financial institutions to comply with police orders to freeze funds associated with designated persons, in this case protesters. With funds hobbled, public sentiment turning against them, and the threat of arrest and financial sanctions looming, the protest movement began to lose momentum. For most of my life, I've considered Canada to have almost the same values as the United States. And yet, what Trudeau did to the truckers is appalling. Something one would expect to see in some third world dictatorship. Can you imagine an American president doing something similar to the anti-war or civil rights protests of the 1960s? To the anti-nuclear protests of the 1980s? the Black Lives Matter protests and riots of 2020? Can this get any worse? Yes, it can. Because technology, which can, which can link things together, makes it even easier for the government to shut you down if they don't like the way you're behaving. Imagine a scenario where the Canadian government could shut off the mobile banking of every protester at the trucker convoy. Not by researching who was there and contacting their banking institutions, they could simply monitor the cellular GPS of all peaceful protesters, as they did for the January 6th protesters, and turn off their mobile banking. Now just imagine if they turned off all their mobile apps, or if we were all linked into a central bank digital currency, and they deducted social credits or pulled money off their tokenized central bank digital currency. Imagine a world where, where your every movement is tracked. Your opinions would be analyzed by artificial intelligence, and you could be instantly penalized for wrong thinking. This is the world that the global elites would like to create with the Great Reset. This is not fantasy. This is not unrealistic conspiracy theory. The technology is already there, and this is the stated goal by the global governments and the World Economic Forum. In response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, Apple Pay and Google Pay shut off the finances of countless ordinary Russian citizens. Viral photos surfaced of massive lines at Moscow's metro system, showing thousands of citizens unable to access their finances, fumbling about in search of cash for train tickets. This is how it was reported in England on February 28, 2022. It was reported in England. Russians can no longer use their bank cards with Google Pay and Apple Pay, as newly imposed financial sanctions hit the country. Apple Pay doesn't work in Russia. My bank sent a message saying services might not be working due to market changes, a Russian citizen told Metro.co.uk on Sunday. As of 2020, 29% of Russians reported using Google Pay, while 20% used Apple Pay. That was my, my English accent. Yeah. Going cashless means your ability to even exist in society can be simply shut off at any time by the government. Do we wonder why Russians might believe the United States is interested in ruining their country? There is a dispute between the leaders of Russia and the West around the notion that we are actively trying to harm the citizens of Russia. How is any of this allowed? Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve Bank explored a digital dollar. From a January, January 20th, 2022 CNBC report on the effort goes as follows. The Federal Reserve on Thursday released its long-awaited exploration of a digital dollar, but took no position on the issuance of a central bank digital currency. Instead, the central bank's 40-page document explores a plethora of issues and notes that public comment will be solicited. solicited. Fed Governor Leal Brainard 
Bernard, who has been nominated as vice chair, is the biggest advocate for the project, while other officials have expressed skepticism. We look forward to engaging with the public, elected representatives, and a broad range of stakeholders as we examine the positives and negatives of a central bank digital currency in the United States, Powell said in a statement. I need some water. Okay. Yeah, I had to, I had to hydrate. All these, um, all this voice acting that I'm probably not very good at. <laughs> Takes a lot out of you. Now, this book takes a certain view on how globalists will execute their plans, not showing their hand while working behind the scenes to bring it about. As I read Powell's statement, he sounds like a typical globalist using a language like engaging with the public, with the public elected representatives and a broad range of stakeholders, which makes me suspect they are further along in their efforts than they admit. China has already rolled out a pilot program for a digital currency, as detailed in a January 10th, 2022 CNBC article. And it goes as follows. China is ramping up its efforts to roll out the digital yuan, 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 to the broader population as the country's tech technology giants like Alibaba and Tencent jump on board. Also known as the ECNY, it's designed to replace the cash and coins already in circulation. It is not a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, in part because it's controlled and issued by the central bank. Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency that isn't backed by any central banks or a single administrator. China's digital yuan is a form of central bank digital currency, CBDC which many other central banks around the world are also working on, though the Chinese central bank is way ahead of its global peers. This isn't fantasy land, it's already here, and the elites are just waiting for the right crisis or incentives to usher people into the new digital system. As we try to make sense of the Russia-Ukraine war, it's probably useful to ask whether the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky seems to be on the side of freedom or on the side of the globalists. If we accept the idea that the globalists are attempting to seize control of technology, we might suspect Zelensky's moves or motives when he announced, um, announced an effort on February 2020 to put the state in a smartphone. This is from a Ukrainian publication. I'm not going to try and do it in a Ukrainian voice because I have no idea how to do that. So I'm just going to read normal. Okay. Ukraine's president and prime minister on February 6th presented the country's mobile e-governance application, DIIA action, which aims to di digitize all government services and play a central role in President Vladimir Zelensky's state in a smartphone concept. By the end of the winter, a digital passport will appear in the app, which will allow users to travel domestically, conduct, conduct banking, and use medical services. <laughs> conduct. This state in a smartphone effort was led by Mikolo Fedorov, the vice prime minister and minister of digital transformation for Ukraine. He is also a young global leader for the World Economic Forum and was a panelist at the WEF Scaling Up Digital Identity Systems session. And this is how he described in his biography on the World Economic Forum. Mikolo Fedorov is a vice prime minister and minister of digital transformation of Ukraine. The youngest minister in the history of Ukrainian politics. Fedorov, at the age of 30, managed to succeed both with opening his own businesses as well as with leading the country's digital revolution. His most important project as minister is the state in a smartphone, which aims by 2024 to have 100% of all government services available online, 
with 20% of services provided automatically without the intervention of an official and one online form to receive a package of services. His biography for the WEF has stated that his most important goal is the state in a smartphone, which aims by 2022 to have 100% of all government services available online. Seems harmless. With 20% of services provided automatically without intervention of an official. Seems scary. Imagine our government automatically removing money from your account or automatically freezing your account based on your right to peacefully protest or your political views or your carbon footprint. Bedrov said during his presentation to the World Economic Forum in 2021, our goal is to enable all life situations with this digital ID, said Fedorov, adding the pandemic has accelerated our progress. First of all, people are really now demanding digital online services. People have no choice but to trust technology. We believe that we have to make the best product possible, a high quality product, a product that is so convenient that a person will be able to disrupt their stereotypes, the breakthrough form, all right, the breakthrough from their fears and start using a government made application. Wow, you're talking about a centralized system totally controlled by the government that not only tracks and knows everything about you, but can freeze your account as it sees fit with no repercussions. Not only that, but these Ukrainian digital ID services will also feature vaccination, electronic passports, and Ukrainian COVID certificates. Ukraine was pioneering a system that governments all around the world could use as a template to control their populations. If we look at the Russian invasion of Ukraine with that perspective, do Putin's actions seem as difficult to understand? Hmm. Definitely prompts thinking, doesn't it? What are your thoughts on that? Imagine all your money is no longer money. It's a credit within a centralized digital system that is administered by the government. It has a fully tracked and traceable serial number. It could be coded to not only allow you to buy meat, Bitcoin, air travel, or gold. It could block your ability to buy a pillow from Mike Lindell's company, MyPillow. <laughs> now factor in a digital world ID a vaccine passport that expires if you're not updated on your boosters and is also tracking your GPS movements to know if you've been at the wrong gatherings or protests. It can measure how far you've traveled and if you're committing the cardinal sin of too much carbon emissions. Say, do, buy, travel, or translate with the wrong company and your credits can be taxed or frozen. This becomes a tool far outside of the scope of monetary policy. It becomes a digital gulag. Of course, we've all heard of the gulags, forced labor camps maintained in the Soviet Union. These gulags become prisons used to capture, control, and enslave dissidents. And what was a dissident? Simply a person who opposed the official policy of an authoritarian state. Now imagine this digital gulag being used in countries around the world or in the United States. In today's world, they do not need a physical gulag or prison camp. They just need to roll out the world ID system, vaccine passports, and central bank digital currency. And once they have this, they can imprison anyone they want into a digital gulag. Banking access, cut off. Medical access, cut off. Taxes confiscated automatically, and credits, which used to be money, are 100% programmable to be deleted, frozen, or removed if you practice wrong think. Not up to date with your 12th booster shot? Financial accounts frozen. Purchasing too much meat or buying products from the wrong companies? Frozen. Attending a peaceful protest that the government deems troublesome? Frozen. Just imagine what happens when everything is centralized into a world ID. 
vaccine passport, and central bank digital currency to all civilians, not just the people that are in the spotlight, right? Or in government or whatever. But to make this just a little scarier, let's talk about the Chinese social credit score system, which will certainly tie into your digital money. This is from a Business Insider article in December 2021 on the system. The Chinese Communist Party has been constructing a moral ranking system for years that will monitor the behavior of its enormous population and rank them all based on their social credit. Like private credit scores, a person's social score can move up and down depending on their behavior. The exact methodology is a secret, but examples of infractions include bad driving, smoking in non-smoking zones, buying too many video games, and posting fake news online, specifically about terrorist attacks or airport security. Other, poten other potential punishable offenses include spending too long playing video games, wasting money on frivolous purchases, and posting on social media. Wow, that was from the Business Insider. Dang. Yeah, that's terrible. It's, that's horrifying, actually. Being discredited or blacklisted in China makes it nearly impossible to get a job, travel, buy things from stores, get a mor mortgage, or have children. You could also find your internet speed slowed down or be prevented from boarding an airplane. That's not to mention the public shaming component as there is even an application that shows you the names and photos of everyone around you who is low on social credits or in financial debt. That's fucking terrible. Actually, you know what? I think I did see something about that. Like, but I just wasn't sure how, I don't know. I've seen something on that before. I would never want to have to experience that. You know what I mean? It's like, it's hard to know for sure if it's happening because you're not there. And we usually, like, you need, usually people, most people need to have proof and go through it and experience it themselves before they believe it. But of course, the horrible part of that is that if you do take it to that point, it's already too late. Like, yeah, you can call it fear mongering or, oh, the, this is, um, these are just people pushing out fear, but it's really not it's not real. But what if it's like one of those things where it's like you don't believe it and you think that it's just like um, fear mongering, but it is happening. And then eventually it comes over to where, you know, into your life. And by then it's too hard. You can't get out of it. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Anyways. Being discredited or blacklisted. Oh, wait, I just read that. All of this is done through algorithmic data, which allows China to monitor everything and build profiles of citizens. Today, massive surveillance cameras are not needed. Your phone is a GPS system, and everything is trackable and traceable through your internet and financial history. This is not me presenting a baseless conspiracy theory, as they like to say. This is all factual and occurring in real time. Then when you combine the modern features of big tech between Google, social media apps, and big banking, your entire life can be easily scored and programmed through a credit system. It is not difficult to see how a central bank digital currency of program programmable financial credits would tie into an overall world ID, vaccine passport, and social credit score system. Now think about the fact Justin Trudeau openly stated that the government he admires most is China. This is from the Toronto Sun in February 2011 regarding Trudeau's deep respect for China's form of government. There should be no surprise Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says he needs more evidence before concluding China's horrific treatment of its minority Uyghur Muslim population is a genocide. Despite having agreed two years ago that Canada's treatment of its indigenous population was a genocide. As Maya Angelou famously put it, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. While Trudeau is taking a less starry-eyed view of China these days in 2013, as liberal leader, he was asked during a ladies' night 
liberal fundraiser what country he most admired besides Canada. He responded, There's a level of admiration I actually have for China. Their basic dictatorship is actually allowing them to turn their economy around on a dime and say, we need to go green. We want to start investing in solar. Mm. Yeah, actually, I remember um, seeing a clip of that a few years ago. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. He did say that. Think about the fact that countries all over the world are scrambling to launch digital IDs, vaccine passports, and central bank digital currencies. Global elites see this as a necessary control tool to retain total power over the population and all social behaviors. Do you see how this all ties back to a digital wallet, which is a front for a social credit score system? The vaccine passports are the Trojan horse for a world ID integrated with a central bank digital currency and social credit score system. The breadcrumbs are all laid out ever so neatly in a row. But it gets even more dystopian if you think about what happened in Canada during the trucker protests of 2022. Under the Emergency Act, Justin Trudeau used terrorism laws to seize the bank accounts of people who donated as little as $50. Wow. So he would put them on a terrorist watch list if they, if anyone was like trying to donate to the cause as little as $50 or um, like maybe not a terrorist watch list, but a list where they would be um, monitored. Ugh. Simply stated, they used emergency orders to suspend the rule of law, labeled them as terrorists. Oh yeah. So lab did label them as terrorists then and seize their financial assets. Mm. Appearing on the Glenn Beck program, former PayPal executive David Sachs said, you have all the ingredients that trust in Justin Trudeau was able to seize on. All you're really lacking is the emergency. Glenn's conversation with Sachs begins with the following questions. How far away from this system are we to have a true credit score. Do you see this happening sooner rather than later? And what do we do to stop it? David Sachs responded, well, this is my main concern is at the end of the day, I'm not a Canadian and I watch with sadness what's happening over there. But ultimately it's going to be up to the Canadians to govern themselves. What I'm mostly concerned about is the precedent that Trudeau has set that progressives here in America might look to implement. And let's identify the elements of the ingredients of this toxic stew that already exists over here. First of all, you've got big tech companies like my alma mater PayPal have been freezing accounts based on working with partisan political groups to shut people out of the financial system. That practice is already taking place. Second, you've got state of emergencies in states like California, where I live, where the governor is still, op still operating under a state of emergency. He has invoked emergency powers that never seem to end, even though we just had a Super Bowl where 30,000 people were sitting elbow to elbow without any masks on, yet we're still in the state of emergency. Third, we have recently the Department of Homeland Security has now defined misinformation about COVID or the election to be a contributor to the terrorist threat level. So in other words, misinformation in their view can contribute to terrorism. So we have now all the ingredients where you have politicians invoking a state of emergencies. You've got big tech companies shunning people out of the political system. And you've got this very scary and dangerous redefinition of terrorism to effectively apply to domestic political dissent. You have all the ingredients there that Justin Trudeau was able to seize on. And all you're really lacking is the emergency necessary to invoke those, those powers. So that is what I'm afraid of. I see all the precedents coming together, but... We have one thing in the United States that Canada doesn't have, which is a rich constitutional tradition. We have the protections under the Constitution. And so I'm hopeful that our Supreme Court would protect us against an authoritarian attack on our liberties. However, there are many in our political system who want to pack the Supreme Court. I know this is some scary stuff, but the only way we can defeat this is to understand what's really happening.
Barry McKillop, Deputy Director of Financial Transactions and Reports Analysis Center, FinTrack, spoke before Canada's House of Commons, um, the House of Commons Finance Committee. The money the organizers managed to raise was not only not cash that funded terrorism or was in any way money laundering. It was simply a way for people living in what they, what they thought was a democratic country, believing was a safe way of expressing their position on an issue. Yeah, these citizens subsequently evidently treated by their government as potential terrorists and money launderers were in fact fed up with COVID and were upset and just wanted to support the cause. Yes, the democratic country of Canada, one in which Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said on December 2020, Canada will always stand up for the right of peaceful protests anywhere around the world. Trudeau's statement was made while criticizing India for its police response to farmers' blockades in Delhi. So let's unpack this. Canada openly condemned foreign governments for squashing legitimate protests. Then, when a protest in Canada threatened their political agenda, they used emergency orders to label them as potential terrorists and freeze their financial assets. Yeah, that's super hypocritical. Oh. Well, that's all for today. We will um, read some more the next time. Hope you guys liked it. Tell me your thoughts about what you think of the book. Um, I'd love to know. And I'll see you later.